Welcome back to Proxam, everybody, and today we're going to be looking at how to play a Craftworld Eldar Unari army in 10th edition. So over the past three or so weeks, I have been playing Unari pretty religiously. I've been playing a mixed Unari list with Dark Eldar and Eldar units, so it's not just Unari in name. It's actually a full-blown Dark Eldar, Craftworld Eldar, and Harlequin mix-up, which is how I assume they are in the lore. So I do want to share that with you guys and the insights that I've gained over the last three or so weeks playing the Unari in 40k battles. So without further ado, let us go ahead and jump right into the video. But first, a quick overview of what we're going to be covering in today's video. We're going to be doing a general analysis of the Unari in 10th edition, their strengths and weaknesses, general tips and strategies when fielding and playing a Unari army, and lastly, an example Unari list of my own that I've been running in 10th edition. Okay, so what are the Unari and how do they work in 10th edition? So a Unari army must have Yvrain as your warlord. This unlocks the use of all Dark Eldar units with the exception of Homunculus Coven units. So you can't use Rax or Homunculus or Kronos or Talos and things like that. Only 50% of your army can be Dark Eldar, but that is a pretty good amount of Dark Eldar. I haven't really had issues with that as of yet. And lastly, you can't take the Solitaire, Avatar of Cain, or Phoenix Lords. So even though you can take Dark Eldar units, there are some other restrictions that you have to keep in mind. However, I do think there are a lot of strengths being able to essentially run Dark Eldar units in your Eldar army. Dark Eldar units synergize extremely well with their Crawford counterparts. And Yvrain is a really strong model. A lot of people don't really consider her in competitive play. Maybe she's a little bit too expensive. Maybe her role is a little bit too niche. She's only really good against anti-infantry. But she's very strong. And she basically dumps out a ton of mortal wounds on enemy infantry that she comes into contact with. Also, the MSU style of the Yunari really enhances the potential of the Incarn. So not only does it enhance the potential for killing enemy units, but it enhances the potential for your own units dying and being able to teleport to those locations. The Unari does have its weaknesses, though, and I would be a little bit, you know, out of place to not mention these. They do lose the CP generation via the Autark. So because the Autark isn't your Warlord, you're not going to be getting one CP a turn automatically. Even though that's not a huge deal, it does kind of sting a little bit sometimes when you're tight on CP. So basically, using things that require a lot of CP, like Fire and Fade, is probably going to be a lot more rare. And as a result, you're probably not going to see as many big units, you know, on the table. So Fire Prisms and things like that, you're probably not going to see that often. Fire and Fade is more of a utility ability used for getting units across the board quickly, and that's it. It's usually not going to be used as a more expensive Phantasm for another shooting unit. Dark Eldar units also don't have Strands of Fade access or Power from Pain, so they lose both abilities. Because they're not in a Dark Eldar detachment, they don't have Power from Pain, and because they're not technically Eldar and don't have the Strands of Fate rule, they cannot benefit from Fate Dice. So that is unfortunate. So that means that Dark Eldar units are losing a little bit of power there. So what are some general tips and strategies when fielding and playing a Yunari army? So when most people think of a Yunari, they think of the Yinkarn. And you would be right. The Yinkarn is a very powerful model, and the Yinkarn carried a lot of my games, I have to say. It was a very big powerhouse in many games, and because of its ability to teleport and then charge, it caught a lot of my opponents either unaware or just with their pants down when they weren't in great positions. As well as just giving my opponent a massive headache trying to figure out where and when the Incarn was going to appear. So the great thing about playing Yunari is that you can present multiple scenarios for a Yinkarn teleport. You have a lot of MSU units that are really good, things like Reavers, Capolite Warriors, and, you know, other units as well, like Scourges. And that really enhances the ability of the Incarn to teleport around the battlefield. And that's not something you typically see in highly competitive Eldar lists. So in highly competitive Eldar lists, there's going to be a little bit less MSU because they have to pay points for those support models, those Wraith Knights and stuff like that. 
So you're probably not going to see as many units on the field in those armies. Also, the ability to capitalize on the synergies between Eldar and Dark Eldar units is invaluable. And it's extremely strong. I'm actually surprised I haven't seen more of this in competitive play, and I guess it's just because the Wraith Knight's so strong. But I think once that thing gets nerfed or brought down to size in a number of different ways, we're going to see more Yunari armies being played. So another great combination is Bladestorm and anti-infantry weapons. Bladestorm automatically procs on critical hits and anti-infantry crits on a 3 plus in the Dark Eldar army. So all poison weapons essentially have anti-infantry 3 plus. So they're going to be getting a ton of extra AP with Bladestorm. Reavers and Phantasm and Fire and Fade is another great combo. So like I said before, this gives the unit a lot of movement. Reavers have a 16-inch movement. They can advance and shoot, which means they can move 16 plus D6 and then Fire and Fade another 16 because they're super fast. And because Phantasm and Fire and Fade count as normal moves, they can proc their ability to deal more mortal wounds to units they move over. It's not a lot of mortal wounds, but it is still something. And it helps a cheap unit like this get a lot more value while also performing objectives. Guide and a Venom is also a very good combo because Guide allows everything to reroll hits. And with Firing Deck, everything inside is also shooting. But the kicker there is that the Venom actually counts as the target for both the shooting attacks and the Guide. So you're going to get to reroll everything, essentially, if you guide a Venom. Your warriors inside are going to be able to shoot, and the Venom is going to be able to reroll its hits as well. And you can also throw a Bladestorm on it. And there's a lot of poison weapons in that unit, typically. You know, Cabalites have, you know, splinter rifles, and those are pretty nasty as well. So there's just a lot of synergy between Dark Eldar units and Eldar abilities that between you and me, work better in an Eldar army than they do a Dark Eldar army. So Dark Eldar, you know, I think the problem with them is they really don't have a lot of great stratagems. A lot of their stratagems are just kind of mediocre, whereas we have things like Phantasm and Fire and Fade. Yes, they do have something like Fire and Fade, and that's fine, but we also have Bladestorm, which while doesn't really work that well with Craftworld Eldar units, works extremely well with Dark Eldar units. So there is some synergies there that are just absolutely very powerful. And in my opinion, more than make up for the fact that Dark Eldar don't get their power from Pain or Strands of Fate. Okay, so here's an example Yunari list of my own that I've been running in 10th edition. And it's basically something that I kind of took a few tries with because the first couple of times I made the list... It was just lacking something, and there were a few units that just didn't work well, and I'll talk about those at the end of the video. So, my Yunari army is built for 2,000 points, and it is a strike force. For characters, I have a Farseer Skyrunner with the Phoenix Gem. Basically, this thing is just here for guide. And yes, it doesn't have Wind Riders because it doesn't need them. The Phoenix Gem and Line of Sight usually protect this guy from a lot of incoming fire. Even Indirect Fire has trouble dealing with him just because of the fact that he does come with a 3 plus save. You do get the benefit of cover against AP weapons, so if something has AP minus 1, you'll still get a 3 plus. You won't be able to get a 2 plus save because of how cover works against AP nothing weapons or, you know, the like. But he is pretty durable, especially with the Phoenix Gem, so if something does get through, he typically just revives on a 2 plus. We have the Visarch, and this is just a fluff pick. I think the Visarch is really cool. I think, why else have a Yunari army if you're not going to run the Triumvirate? So I did include the Visarch in there as well. However, in hindsight, another unit of Reavers probably would have done me better. We have the Incarn, of course, which basically just a massive beat stick unit that can teleport anywhere on the map, can you know teleport and then charge in and shoot and stuff like that and just deal massive damage to enemy units especially if your opponent is not prepared for it. So the Yinkarn is very competitive, shown up in competitive lists quite often, and it's just a really powerful tool to have in your toolbox. Yvrain is also in this. She has to be because she's your warlord, and she does a lot of damage on her own. She's actually with the Visarch and a unit of Harlequins, and they just smash enemy infantry blocks. So if an opponent is running a big block of infantry that's very powerful, 
usually Ukrainian friends can take them out pretty easily. And she's getting a lot of synergy with the Vizark and also the Harlequins. So the Harlequins basically give the unit plus one to charge or plus one to wound when they charge, I should say. And so when they charge in, they're dealing massive damage to that enemy unit. And they are going to be in a transport. They're going to be in a wave serpent. So a wave serpent is the only vehicle that can really carry all of them because, you know, you can't put Harlequins in a raider. So that's not an option. And even if it was, I would still take the wave serpent because I just think the Wave Serpent is better for the points. I gave it two Shuriken Cannons, basically a twin Shuriken Cannon and the regular Shuriken Cannon. And this is because the way I use my Wave Serpent is very aggressive. And I've pretty much always used Wave Serpents this way. I know Bright Lances are technically better value for the cost. But when you're in combat, when you're trying to engage enemy infantry units in close combat, it helps to have the Shuriken Cannons to give you that edge against that unit. So a lot of times what I would do this thing is just throw it into enemy shooting units. So things like intercessors or even sometimes heavy intercessors just kind of tie them up in combat. Yes, I do have a few opponents that run a couple of units of heavy intercessors just because they look cool. And yeah, they may not be the most competitive unit in the game, but they certainly are tough. And the wave serpent is really good at dealing with them. So essentially a heavy intercessor unit is something that could actually really devastate a lot of light MSU style units. And it's very tough. So yes, there is poison in this list, but sometimes that poison is going to have to go after other targets. The Wave Serpent is really a great counter to this because they can just charge in, deal a tank shock, get stuck into combat, and then the intercessors either have to fall back and potentially, if they're battle shocked, take some damage. Or they just have to stay in combat with the Wave Serpent, which is not ideal for them. So Wave Serpent is a very good model for disruption purposes and blocking, you know, lanes of charging and line of sight and things like that. There's also a Venom. Now, the Venom is going to carry warriors in it, Cabalite warriors, and that, you know, the Venom is pretty good. Two Splinter Cannons give it good damage. The Cabalites inside also add to its damage with Guide and things, so it is a pretty good model for 80 points. It's nothing spectacular, it's very squishy, and yeah, that's about it. That's all I can say about the Venom. Really cool model, and I suggest if you guys are using a Venom in your Yunari, definitely consider using the Blade Storm combo with it. If you have five Cabalite Warriors in there, they're also basically firing off, you know, eight to ten shots with, you know, Splinter Rifles or maybe even a Splinter Cannon. I don't have a Splinter Cannon in this list, but it's still pretty powerful in and of itself. It's going to do a lot of AP damage. And your opponent is going to be taken by surprise usually because Venoms normally don't do that much damage. But with Bladestorm, they can really ump up the ante. As far as the other data sheets go, I have two units of Rangers in this list. So you might be thinking, well, why do you have two units of Rangers? That seems a little bit odd. Now, I did play around with some different things, but what I found was Rangers are just good for controlling the midboard, especially since I don't have a unit of Mandrakes in this list. So I know... I did a video on Mandrakes. Mandrakes are cool. I love Mandrakes. They're really troll. They're really effective at objectives and things like that. I just found with the massive amount of MSU that I had in my army, I really never needed extra objective units. So the Rangers are a really good unit, A, for precision. They have precision attacks on all their weapons. And B, they're really good at controlling the board with Infiltrate. So I did have two of these units. One of the biggest weaknesses of this list is units... And models that can infiltrate past your defenses and strike you first. So if you have a lot of, you know, infiltrators in your list or models with a scout move and I have nothing to block you from getting to me and getting line of sight on my very fragile MSU units, then I'm going to lose the game very quickly, possibly in turn one. So I did take two units of Rangers to kind of mitigate that for my opponents. I also have two units of Shadow Spectres in this list, and basically they're there to kill heavy infantry, things that my other units can't. Because I have poison on a lot of my weapons, which is anti-infantry 3+, it means that I don't have a lot of anti-mounted weaponry or things that can take down beasts and other units that don't have the infantry keyword. This is where Shadow Spectres come in. Shadow Spectres are there to basically cover the weaknesses of Splinter Weaponry, which is non-infantry units. So Splinter Weaponry, while good against infantry, is absolute trash against basically everything else in the game. 
and shadow specters are there to fill that void. So they do really good damage against bikes and things like that, you know, attack bikes or outriders or even other Eldar jet bikes. They're very good at taking out because they have those damage through weapons with a good strength and a good AP. And also they're very hard to hit back because of their move shoot move ability, which a lot of units in this army have. Now, just to address the elephant in the room really quick, this unit probably will get nerfed. I expect it to be 100 points by this time tomorrow. So if you're watching this for the first time and you're looking at the points and you're like, no, those are 100 points or those are 110 points, whatever it is, just know that this was before the nerf and that, yes, they are 80 points now, but I still expect them to be very effective even at 100 points when they do get nerfed. All right, so the list also has three Shroud Runners in it. This is a utility unit meant to score on objectives, but also mark targets for destruction. So giving lethal hits to things like Shadow Spectres, Warriors, Cabalite Warriors, of course, and Scourges can really help the army hit a lot harder against those key targets. The list also has a troop of 10. You have two Fusion Pistols in there. Of course, the lead player has a Power Sword. I also have two Neuro Disruptors, and basically, you know, all the Harlequins have Harlequin Special Weapons. So this is the unit that Yvrain is going to be a part of, and it is going to be a Death Star Cracker. So typically what I do with this unit is I keep it back until my opponent gets into position, takes a center objective or something like that with a substantially tough unit, and then I use this to break open that center objective later in the game. And that's it. Basically, that's all they do. I don't like to throw away Yvrain and the Visarch and a huge unit of Quins alone on a unit that is maybe not so valuable. So if you are running a big unit like this, you don't want to just send it after just random, you know, enemy infantry. You want to send it after the opponent's biggest threats, namely things like Terminators and other Death Stars. And that might require a little bit of patience. You might have to wait a turn or two for it to be viable to go ahead and you know, dump these guys out and charge them into the enemy. So don't be afraid to wait a couple of turns for that moment. All right, so on to the Dark Eldar units. We have a unit of Cabalite Warriors. They're going to be split up by the Venom. The ones with the Dark Lance and Blaster usually go in the Venom. And the ones that just have the Splinter Rifles are usually just going to be objective jockeys going from objective to objective, making them sticky. So their role is basically just an insurance policy for objective play. Of course, most of this army is MSU, so there's not a lot of objective holding power, so you do need something in this list to be able to ensure that you get primary points. We also have a Ravager. So I find the Ravager is just really good for the cost. 95 points for three Dark Lances. It's cheaper than, you know, Scourges and stuff like that. It hits more accurately, and it's just generally a really good support piece to have in your army to deal with enemy vehicles we also have two units of reavers they both have a heat lance the arena champion is armed with all of the special stuff so the heat lance the cluster caltrops and the agonizer a lot of people go with the grab talons on these guys i chose to go with the cluster caltrops mostly because i you know kind of value the chance for a reroll on their special ability rather than having the lance roll when they charge in I just find that having the Lance rule on just the Arena Champion, and by the way, it's a per model basis, so only the Arena Champ actually gets the Lance bonus, is kind of a weak upgrade, so I just decided to go with the Cluster Caltrops to be able to reroll those Mortal Wound chances when they fly over an enemy unit. Other than that, these guys are there to score objectives, they're there to get to certain areas of the board, and just essentially be disruption for enemy units they are decent in close combat although they're not the best but what they also excel at is not only being able to charge enemy units and be a disruption but when they die they make a great teleport target for the incarn so oftentimes what will happen is you will charge in to the enemy unit they will attack back they're not going to be able to kill all the reavers and then during their turn if they choose not to fall back and shoot them the reavers will die in their assault phase which means you get a really easy teleport with the incarn across the battlefield so basically to summarize this unit they do good on pretty much everything you need them to do they're decent at shooting they're decent in close combat 
They provide utility with secondary objectives, and on top of it, they're a great MSU unit target for the Yinkarn to teleport if your opponent needs to kill them, which your opponent will shoot them, will try to kill them throughout the battle, so it does give you extra avenues to, you know, enhance the Yinkarn. As for my other units, I have three units of Scourges, probably a little bit of overkill here, but I really love Scourges and I really wanted to make use of them in this list. So I have two units with Dark Lances. So the Dark Lances are just going to play it safe. They're going to stay back out of Overwatch range because Overwatch is so deadly. Dark Lances are a great counter to that because they have such good range. They stay back in the backfield and just shoot. Their only real weakness is indirect fire, so as long as your opponent doesn't have much indirect fire weaponry, they're going to be safe. I do have one unit with heat lances, and this unit is just to basically be a counterpunch to any hard targets moving up the battlefield. Things like land raiders, toughness 12, sometimes even toughness 13 models that are just going to be too much for dark lances to handle. The scourges with heat lances can easily take them out. And yes, they do have to brave an overwatch, which is why sometimes it's beneficial to, you know, bait out an overwatch earlier that turn so that your opponent can't essentially overwatch twice unless they have some sort of special rule that allows them to do so. And, you know, once your opponent burns through that overwatch, your scourges with heat lances will be safe to move up within nine inches and melt that vehicle to shreds or melt that monster to absolute shreds. D6 damage, plus 3 for the Melter Rule within 9 inches. At strength 14, AP minus 4 is going to burn down most targets pretty easily. Alright, so in conclusion, the Yunari in combination with a Dark Eldar style MSU list can be an absolute nightmare for your opponent to manage effectively, especially considering the Yinkarn can immediately teleport to the destroyed unit, friend, or foe. Although a lot of people are leaning heavily into the meta Eldar units right now, especially in tournaments, I think Yunari lists have the potential with Dark Eldar units to outclass them if played well. And yes, you know, right now the meta Eldar lists are very easy to play. You know, they're very kind of simple in design and combinations are very easy to pull off. But I think for an experienced player, a Yunari list like this can actually be more rewarding and more successful against a wider array of opponents. One of the biggest challenges to the Eldar at the moment in competitive play is actually Gene Stealer Colt, who can have, you know, tons of kind of expendable infantry at their disposal. And I think this style of list really enhances your ability to actually, you know, go up against Gene Stealer Colt comfortably and be able to defeat them. Because you have so many really fast moving units, that can easily get rid of their reinforcement tokens. So Reavers are really good at this. Scourges can deep strike in, and they're also pretty good at dealing with that kind of stuff. Even if it's in the opponent's backfield, somewhere, you know, behind line of sight and stuff like that, you have the mobility to reach them usually because, you know, you have a very fast army. So while I don't think this type of list is going to be great against everything out there, I do think it's going to be highly effective against the Eldar's current counters. Gene Stealer Colt and, you know, some of the other more, you know, horde style armies. All right. So to end the video, I do want to talk a little bit about what I could have done with this list to make it even better. So one of the things that I found running this list is that even though I went in with it wanting to be lore friendly, I have to say, if you're looking to make the most effective Unari list possible, I think the Visark is a mistake. And I don't say this because I hate the Visark or, you know, I'm a super competitive meta chasing player or anything like that. I love running the Visark. He was really cool. The problem is he doesn't really add a whole lot to the army. Giving fights first to a unit of Harlequins is not very good because once your opponent knows you have fights first, they're just going to fall back, right? No one is going to stay in combat with a Death Star Cracker like this. So I had several scenarios where I engaged my opponent in close combat. It was Yvrain, the Visark, and the Ten Harlequins up against a big unit of Terminators, a big block of Chaos Terminators or something like that. And oftentimes, they would manage to kill about half the Terminators in the unit, and then my opponent the next turn, knowing that I had fight first, would just fall back, would just run away. And then would proceed to shoot them. Now, they were decently durable to shooting because they have a 4 plus invul, a 5 plus feel no pain, and of course, you've resurrects models, which is great. 
but the Visarch didn't really help their cause too much. And I often found myself wishing that I just had another unit and the Visarch wasn't even there at all, right? Wishing that I had something like Mandrakes to pull some extra objective duties or having another unit of Shadow Specters or maybe Shroud Runners or things like that. So I often found myself really wishing <laughs> I hadn't taken the Visarch. But again, he was a fun model. I did have fun with him. He's just not that good. And I think even when you run him in a big Death Star like that, his effectiveness is just a little bit less than desirable for the points you pay. The other thing I would consider doing is switching out the Dark Lance and the Blaster on the Cabalite Warriors to a Shredder and a Splinter Cannon. The reason why is because when you use Bladestorm on that model, it's an absolute infantry shredder. And I already had a lot of anti-tank in this list. I mean, I'm packing four Dark Lances for each Scourge unit, so that's eight Dark Lances, three from the Ravager. I have another two Heat Lances on my Reavers, right? I have another four Heat Lances off my Scourges. I just have a lot of anti-tank. And I found that the one on the Kabbalite Warriors wasn't really doing anything. I mean, it was good. You know, I took a few shots at a vehicle here and there. It just wasn't needed. It was overkill. So I think what I would do is I would switch that up, increase the anti-infantry firepower of that unit, and just make it a dedicated anti-infantry killing machine. And that way, I think it would add a lot more value to the army as a whole. And it would make a good Bladestorm target for when I really needed an infantry unit dead or weakened enough so that, you know... Obviously, Yvrain and the Harlequins can charge into a Death Star and murder it in a single turn so that it can't, you know, obviously then just fall back, <laughs> right? Because that was the problem mainly that I had is that it was very good at cracking open Death Stars. It would have defeated a Death Star over two rounds of combat, but oftentimes my opponent would just fall back and I would be left out in the open to be shot at, which is a problem with Eldar units in general, right? You go in there, you do a lot of damage, you're doing really well, you know, you're trading up, and then your opponent just says, oh, I'm out of here, falls back, shoots you to death, right? And even a 4-plus invul save and a 5-plus feel no pain is not going to save you against a whole army with devastating wounds, potentially, just like Chaos Space Marines or just regular Space Marines with access to Oath of Moment, right? Which can really devastate infantry with bolters and other things like that. And that's basically it. I think this is a, you know, obviously this is a pre-nerf list. So we'll see what the nerfs bring in and what I have to change. But overall, I think it was a success. I won a lot of my games. Did lose a couple against, you know, certain armies. But they were hard-fought games. I never felt like I was really behind in any of them until the very end. When, of course, Eldar Fragility failed me. Which, as it should, right? We're not an exceptionally tough faction. But we do have a lot of speed on our side. And a lot of damage to make up for it. So yeah, even though it wasn't, you know, something you would see in a tournament, it was extremely fun and I felt like a lot of my games were not only really fun, but very close and very competitive. So yeah, if you are running a Yunari army or interested in running Yunari, definitely give something like this a shot, you know, with your own favorite units, of course, and see how you feel about it. I had a lot of fun and I know that if you're kind of like me and that you like really fast, hard-hitting stuff that maybe can't get hit that hard back, this will probably be the army for you. All right, everybody, that's going to be it for today. Thanks for watching this video, and I'll see you guys next time. Thank you to all my patrons and supporters who have supported the channel over the last months. Your help has helped the channel grow and become better. If you do want to become a Patreon member and support the channel, I have free trials activated, which grant you permanent access to our Discord community, which is a community of Eldar players and enthusiasts who enjoy talking about strategy, tactics, and, of course, hobbying. I will leave the link for that in the description. I also have a channel store page and am an Amazon affiliate, so if you want to grab some Eldar-inspired apparel to wrap your local game store, or grab some discounted Eldar miniatures off of Amazon, go ahead and check out the links in the description as well. All right, everybody, that's going to be it for today. Peace out. I'll see you guys after the balanced data slate. It's going to be a doozy, guys. And make sure you brace for it because it is coming in hard and it is coming in fast. And after it's over... I will be there to talk you guys through it. All right, everybody, peace out and see you guys next time. Have a good one, everybody. See you later.